Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are going to continue to read Moby Dick. So, let's continue. Chapter 29. Enter Ahab. To him, Stub. Some days elapsed, and ice and icebergs all astern. The Pequod now went rolling through the bright Quito Spring, which, at sea, almost perpetually reigns on the threshold of the eternal August of the Tropic. The warmly cool, clear, ringing, perfumed, overflowing, redundant days were as crystal goblets of per Persian sherbet, heaped up, flaked up with rose water slow, snow. The starred and stately nights seemed haughty dames in jeweled velvets, nursing at home in lonely pride the memory of their absent conquering earls, the golden helmeted sons. For sleeping man, t'was hard to choose between such winsome days and such seducing nights. But all the witcheries of that unwanting weather did not merely lend new spells and potencies to the outward world. Inward they turned upon the soul, especially when the still mild hours of eve came on. Then memory shot her crystals as the clear ice most forms of noiseless twilights, and all these subtle agencies, more and more they wrought on Ahab's texture. Old age is always wakeful, as if the longer linked with life, the less man has to do with aught that looks like death. Among sea commanders, the old greybeards will oftenest have the, leave their berths to visit the night-cloaked deck. It was so with Ahab only that now, of late, he seemed so much to live in the open air, that truly speaking, his visits were more to the cabin than from the cabin to the planks. It feels like going down into one's tomb, he would mutter to himself, for an old captain like me to be descending this narrow scuttle, to go to my grave dug berth. So, almost every twenty-four hours, when the watches of the night were set, and the band on decks sentinelled the slumbers of the band below, and when if a rope was to be hauled upon the forecastle, the sailors flung it not rudely down, as by day, but with some cautiousness dropped it to its place for fear of disturbing their slumbering shipmates. When this sort of steady quietude would begin to prevail, habitually the silent steersman would watch the cabin scuttle, and ere long the old man would emerge, griping at the iron banister, sorry, gripping at the iron banister, to help his crippled way. Some considering touch of humanity was in him, for at times like these he would usually ab abstained he usually abstained from patrolling the quarter deck, because to his wearied mates, seeking repose within six inches of his ivory heel, such would have been the, the reverberating crack and din of that bony step, that their dreams would have been on the crunching teeth of sharps sharks. But once the mood was on him too deep for common regardings, and as with heavy lumber-like pace he was measuring the ship from taffrail to main fast, mainmast, Stubb, the old second mate, came up from below with a certain unassured, depre deprecating humorousness, hinted that if Captain Ahab was pleased to walk the planks, then no one would say nay, but there might be some way of muffling the noise, hinting something indistinctly and hesitant, hesitatingly about a globe of toe, and the insertion into it of the ivory heel. Ah, Stubb, thou didst not know Ahab then. Am I a cannibal, Stubb, said Ahab, that thou wouldst wad me that fashion? But go thy ways, I had forgot, below to thy nightly grave, where such as ye sleep between shr shrouds, to use ye to the f to use ye to the filling one at last, down, dog, and kennel. Starting at the unforeseen concluding exclamation of the so suddenly scornful old man, Stubb was speechless a moment, then said excitedly, I am not used to be spoken to that way, sir. I do but less than half like it, sir. Avast, gritted Ahab between his set teeth, and violently moving away as if to avoid some passionate temptation. No, sir, not yet, said Stubb, emboldened. I will not tamely be called a dog, sir. Then be called ten times a donkey, and a mule, and an ass, and be gone, or I'll clear the world of thee. 
As he said this, Ahab advanced upon him with such overbearing terrors in his aspect that Stubb involuntarily retreated. I was never served so before without giving a hard blow for it, muttered Stubb, as he found himself descending the cabin scuttle. It's very queer. Stop, Stubb, somehow, now. I don't well know whether to go back and strike him or... What's that? Down here on my knees and pray for him? Yes. That was the thought coming up in me, but it would be the first time I ever did pray. It's queer, very queer, and he's queer too. Aye, take him fore and aft. He's about the queerest old man Stubb ever sailed with. How he flashed at me. His eyes like powder pans. Is he mad? Anyway, there's something on his mind, as sure as there must be something on a deck when it cracks. He ain't in his bed now, either, more than three hours out of the twenty-four. And he don't sleep then. Didn't that doughboy, the steward, tell me that of a morning he always finds the old man's hammock clothes all rumpled and tumbled, and the sheets down at the foot, and the coverlid almost tied into knots, and the pillow a sort of frightful hot, as though a baked brick had been on it. A hot old man. I guess he's got what some folks ashore call a conscience. It's a kind of tick-dolly row, they say. Worse nor a toothache. Well, well. I don't know what it is, but the Lord keep me from catching it. He's full of riddles. I wonder what he goes into the afterhold for, every night, as Doughboy tells me he suspects. What's that for? I should like to know. Who's made appointments with him in the hold? Ain't that queer now? But there's no telling. It's the old game. Here goes for a snooze. Damn me, it's worth a fellow's while to be born into the world, if only to fall right asleep. And now that I think of it, that's about the first thing babies do. And that's a sort of queer too. Damn me, but all things are queer, come to think of them. But that's against my principles. Think not is my eleventh commandment, and sleep when you can is my twelfth. So here goes again. But how's that? Didn't he call me a dog? Blazes. He called me ten times a donkey, and piled a lot of jackasses on top of that. He might as well have kicked me, and done with it. Maybe he did kick me, and I didn't observe it. I was so taken all aback with his brow, somehow. It flashed like a bleached bone. What the devil's the matter with me? I don't stand right on my legs. Coming afoul of that old man has a sort of turn... has a has a sort of turned me wrong side out by the Lord. I must have been dreaming, though. How, how, how? But the only way's to stash it. So here goes to hammock again, and in the morning I'll see how this plaguey juggling me thinks over by daylight. Chapter 30. The Pipe When Stubb had departed, Ahab stood for a while, leaning over the bulwarks, and then... As had been usual with him of late, calling a sailor of the watch, he sent him below for his ivory stool and also his pipe. Lighting the pipe at the binnacle lamp and planting the stool on the weather side of the deck, he sat and smoked. In old Norse times the thrones of the sea-loving Danish kings were fabricated, saith tradition, of the tusks of the narwhal. How could one look at Ahab then, seated on that tripod of bones without bethinking him of the royalty it symbolised? For a Khan of the plank, and a king of the sea, and a great lord of the leviathans was Ahab. Some moments passed during which the thick vapour came from his mouth in quick and constant puffs, which blew back again into his face. How now, he soliloquised at last, withdrawing the tube. This smoking no longer soothes. Oh, my pipe, hard must it go with me if thy charm be gone. Here have I been unconsciously toiling, not pleasuring, aye, and ignorantly smoking to windward all the while, to windward, and with such ner nervous whiffs, as if, like the dying whale, my final jets were the strongest and fullest of trouble. What business have I with this pipe, this thing that is meant for sereneness, to send my send up mild white vapours among wild, mild white hairs, not among torn iron-grey locks like mine? I'll smoke no more. He tossed the still-lighted pipe into the sea. The fire hissed in the waves. The same instant the, same, the ship shot by the bubble the sinking pipe made. With slouched hat, Ahab lurchingly paced the planks. 
And I think with that we will actually end there because that takes us quite nicely up to the 10 minutes. So thank you very much for joining me. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, and I will say we will be back tomorrow with more of the longing, so be sure to be there for that. Thank you very much and goodbye.